Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the things I really appreciated about these three young women and really my confirmation class in general over the last few years is that these are some people who are not afraid to ask the hard questions. They giggle. Because they know what I'm talking about. No, it's true. It just comes right out. We're going to be going through whatever, and it doesn't even have to be on topic. <laughs> hey, what about this? Stop everything. Let's talk. You know, and, and it's, I really appreciate that. Um, because it shows that, that they're wondering about things. They're thinking about things. And, 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 they, and they really want to know what it's all about. It might surprise you, but it won't be a surprise to a lot of other people, that there was a day and age when asking the hard question was a less than acceptable thing to do. In, in something like a confirmation class or Sunday school or whatnot, uh, the teacher or the pastor, whoever it was, was really there to, to take the information of the faith, deposit it into the students so that they can then regurgitate it. Okay? I have a question. Let's just say it's a hard question. Often, perhaps, the answer could have very e easily been, we don't ask questions like that. Because the only way you would be asking a question like that would be as if you were doubting. You're not doubting, are you? No, no, I'm not doubting. No, I won't ask a question like that ever again. So we learn not to ask the hard questions. We learn that it's a bad thing to have doubts in your head. It's a bad thing to look at the world around you and say, why? Why is it this way? Why do we believe the things that we believe? Why is it important that we believe the things that we believe? And why would we even care enough to have someone come up and say, yes, I do believe. Yes, I will stand on my own two feet of faith and claim this faith to be my own. Well, it's a dangerous thing to stop asking the hard questions. I will tell you that right away. Because we live in a day and age where not only are there hard questions, they're getting harder. I don't know if you've noticed this, but it just seems like we live in a world right now where right is becoming wrong. And wrong right. Have you seen that? I've seen that. And that, that, that throws a bunch of questions in, into the pot. And, and the world moves faster. We, we live in, in really the, the, the pace of life. The, we live in a world that is faster than any other time in history, largely because of technology. If I, pulled, if I wanted to, I could pull out my cell phone and talk to someone on the other side of the world right now. Think about that. Think about that in the scope of human history. How long would it take for a message to get halfway around the world just a few years ago? <laughs> and when it comes to evil, when it comes to the destructive things of our world, they are more accessible than ever. Just Google it, right? Knowing looks from our confirmation class, they're going, yeah. Seriously, just Google it. Now, let me just say, if we're not asking the hard questions, if we're not finding out the new hard questions to ask, if we don't have an answer for some of these hard questions, or not at least willing to ponder it together, I will tell you, there is a search engine named Google that is more than happy to do it for us. And imagine what comes up there. It's probably not what I've spent two years teaching these girls. And probably not what we collectively believe as Christians. It's important that we ask the hard questions. Well, the world we live in today is remarkably similar to the world of, of uh, ancient Rome that Paul was writing to when he was writing to the Ephesians. 
they were undergoing major shifts in their society and were undergoing similar changes as well. Good roads, big cities, lots of money, and a permissive society. You put all of that together and you get a world that looks, honestly, a lot like the one we live in right now. And so when we hear Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, it rings truer. It, it hits a little closer to home. And so I, I want to I take us through that. And you can open up to your bulletins to Ephesians, uh, to our God Speak lessons from Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to go through a few of these things that Paul writes here. And I think, that, I think we're going to find it to be very timely. Very timely. So right from the beginning, verse 17. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do, in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality, so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. You could have been writing that today, right? <laughs> there are a couple of things I want to focus in on there. This idea of, of having hardened hearts and losing our sensitivity. It's an interesting concept, but it's something I see. And, and there's a game being played. We're all a part of the game. But there's a game being played in our society. It's kind of a game of one-upsmanship. The world's trying to get your attention, and there are many voices many images trying to get your attention. And in order to get your attention, the best trick we've got in the book is to excite your fight or flight response. Okay, this is something we all have when a dangerous situation, the adrenaline, whatnot, endorphins, whatnot, come in, or, or in, in times of great pleasure, what makes things feel good, right? So flash something on the screen, do something, make something, put yourself into a situation, and suddenly this very basic response happens in us, and it, we feel excited, we feel happy, we feel pleasure, whatever it might be, and they've got our attention. All right? And whatever they want to do with that attention, usually it's there to make money, honestly, um, but they want to do something with that attention, all right? And it's going to bring out some sort of feeling of pleasure, but it's very short-lived, it goes away really quickly. Well, now that they've gotten this response out of us, they want to do it again. But in order to do it again, that thing, whatever it might be, has to be just a little more violent, has to be a little bit more risque, has to be a little bit more shocking than the thing that came before it, because eh, that just doesn't do it for me anymore. So now we've ratcheted it up another notch. And when we look at that, oh, oh, wow, now it does it for us. And it has to go up, and up, and up. And what happens to our hearts? They become hard. What happens to our sensitivity? It becomes lost. And even at the very end of what I just read in, 17, in, uh, in verse 19, we have a continual lust for more. Don't we? Because you can't quite get enough, and it never quite satisfies. Now this is, this is a challenging thing for us. What are we going to do in the midst of a world like that? I just love the very next thing that Paul writes here in verse 20. You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. You did not come to know Christ that way. And this is, this is very near and dear to me right now. Because for the last two years, I've been teaching these three young women how to know Christ. So what have we learned about the way Christ has this in, in, in the midst of this setting? What are we to do with our hearts when it comes to Jesus? Well, I'll tell you one thing. The last thing Jesus wants is for our hearts to be hard. Because when our hearts are hard, all we can think about is ourselves. But when our hearts are soft, we can live a life of love. 
Now, I need to define the word love. It's really important we understand what love is. The world out there that's going to try to shock you into submission is going, is going to tell you that love is an emotion. Love is a feeling. Love is something for you. But that's not the way God has defined us. Certainly not the way Jesus has taught us love, right? Love is a commitment. Love is a commitment for someone else where someone else receives the benefit. That's love. That's love. And in order to love, you have to have a soft heart. Think about it. Because you actually have to think about someone else. You have to think about someone else and their situation, their, their life, and, and the, way, the way they think about things. And, and, and then want for them what is best. Not just what they think is best, but what truly is best by the way God created this world in the first place. And if you think about it, that's exactly what Jesus did. Right? He thought about us. He could have just sat up there in heaven and said, look at that. <laughs> Why did we say we weren't going to flood this place again? You know, he could have. He could have. But he didn't because he loves us. So he came and became a human and walked this earth with us. And he suffered all the very same things, all the same temptations that we suffer. He taught us truth in the midst of a world of selfishness. And then he showed us love by dying on a cross for our forgiveness. A death that we deserve. He loves us that much. And then loves us enough to rise three days later to show us that when you're in this kingdom, it means you have a life now and a life that goes on forever. He loves us enough to then give us faith in our hearts through our baptism so that we can believe in this grace of God, so that we can, we can make it our own. Now think of that. At what point in the process is Jesus thinking about himself? Now, so we as the ones who learn Christ, we, are, we as the ones who have received Christ, then take the love that we have seen from God and we turn it around into the lives of other people. And that requires us to have a soft heart. It requires us to be sensitive to the needs of others, the pain, and even our eyes open to the kinds of things that this world wants to flash in front of us. So that we don't become desensitized. But when we see it, we become resensitized to the pain and the hurt and the evil that is flashed before us. And maybe even trying to tempt us from within our own hearts. This next part is particularly apropos. Verse 22. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, I don't know about you, but when I start hearing about old self and new self, what's that get you thinking of? Baptism. Because right? that's what happens in our baptism. Well, essentially, Paul's just saying, live your baptism, right? He's saying, when you were baptized, that old you, that old you that, that loves the, the evil and the destructive things of this world, that old you is drowned under the water and stays there. And a new person resurrects out of the water. A new person who sees their Father in heaven as the one who's created them and loves them and provides for them. And that we're his children. We are new people who have been forgiven of all of our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ, a part of anything that we've done. Forgiven by Jesus, who then also forgive other people. We are ones who have been given a Holy Spirit, a different kind of life, a different kind of priorities, a different kind of essence inside of ourselves, so that in the midst of a world filled with every kind of evil thing, we can be the ones who hold on to truth and love our enemies. That's what's given us in our baptism. And what Paul essentially says is keep that old self under the water. And you do it by repenting. And you do it by saying that, that I need Jesus and I can't do this on my own. I need Jesus. I need his forgiveness. I need his love. I need my Father in heaven to protect. 
protect me. I need the Holy Spirit to keep me true to this in the midst of this world filled with every kind of temptation. And hold on to that new self. That new one that is that has created you. I love the fact that we wear white robes on Confirmation Sunday. Because white is the symbol of purity. That's what today is all about. Saying, I'm going to live my baptism. I'm going to live my baptism for the rest of my life. Verse 25, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. It's an interesting phrase there, one that I think really applies to what we're talking about today. In your anger, do not sin. In your anger, do not sin. Later on, we're not going to be able to get to this this morning, but um, later on in this passage, Paul talks about anger. He says, hey, put it off. Don't, don't, don't go down that route of anger. Jesus, on the Sermon on the Mount, tells us that anger is just as bad as murder. Then how is Paul able to say, in your anger, do not sin? I think what Paul is doing is he's acknowledging that we live in the midst of this world filled with every kind of evil thing. There are two kinds of anger. There's a righteous anger and there's a selfish anger. And every one of us can identify with both of them. Let me give you some examples of, of my righteous anger. It's in the news recently. There's a, there's a Kenyan woman who Converted from Islam to Christianity, she has been given a death sentence. That burns. Okay, that burns. 200 little girls kidnapped by this Nigerian group out there. Who knows what they're doing? Okay, that gets me. You know, it makes me clench a fist. Every time, every time I hear about a neglected child, uh, an abused child, someone, someone sent into, into sex trafficking, or, or, even, or even all of these messes that we get into that may lead to an abortion or something like that, it just burns. It's like, no. No. It's not the way he made it. It's not the way it's supposed to be. Why God? Why why the injustice? Why would you even allow for something like that to happen? You know, and, and all sorts of all sorts of questions come along with these every single new thing, every inventive way that we have for evil. Every time we have new questions that you see in your anger, do not sin. In the midst of your hard questions that we have to ask, keep a soft heart. Keep a heart of love. Because the answer to every one of those questions is love. Now I described one kind of anger. The other kind of anger comes from selfishness. It becomes because I, you know, I feel like I'm entitled. I feel like I'm better than that. I feel like I'm better than you. Uh, you've done something bad to me, so now I'm going to have to be bad to you. You know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth kind of stuff. And now I'm angry at someone. I'm angry at myself. In your anger, do not sin. There are plenty of hard questions there, too. Why am I tempted like this? Why would somebody think so badly of me? Why would somebody hate me? Why do I see so many people hurting each other out there in the world? In your anger, do not sin. In the midst of your hard questions, keep a soft heart and know that love is the answer. Remember, not the emotion. Commitment. Love is the answer to every one of those questions. In a few moments here, you're going to be standing right where I am, and you're going to be kneeling here, and you're going to be making some promises. Now, don't be offended by this, but these are promises 
that are a whole lot bigger than you'll ever understand, at least at this age. Maybe 20 years from now, you'll be able to look back at your confirmation day and say, wow, I made that kind of promise. That's okay. You might even think that today's the end of something, like the end of all those questions. Like somehow, we've asked all of the hard questions in confirmation class. <laughs> They're already laughing. And, and now, hey, now I'm confirmed and I don't have to ask any hard questions anymore and I can skate. <laughs> I'm sorry, this is the beginning. This is the beginning. Because you're saying, I'm gonna live the baptized life. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna actually do this. And when you do it, you're gonna encounter a world where there are actually more hard questions. There are gonna be more times when you're gonna want, you're gonna be encountering the evil in the world and not going along with it, which means when you butt heads with it, there's a hard question there. So if anything, you're, you're entering into a sphere where there are gonna be more hard questions, more times when you doubt even in your mind, and you're gonna to need to come to somebody and say, how does this work? This is hard. And that's why you, you, we don't have a little tiny ceremony with just the three of you and me and maybe some family. We do this together with the body of Christ. Because how many people here have it all figured out? Huh, not a hand. And certainly not mine. We don't have it figured out. We're all doing this together. We're all on this journey together. And I have one more thing very important that I need to say to you. We need you on this journey. Because for so many people in this room, the, the world that I described at the beginning of my sermon is absolutely foreign. We don't get it. But you do. You know the hard questions to ask. And you're going to be the generation that helps us to find the answers. We need you to be a part of this body of Christ so that we know the hard questions to ask and how to answer them for your generation. So that together, together as God's people, when we have the hard questions, we can have a God who speaks to every generation and gives us soft hearts filled with love.